Welcome to this morning's Regional Transportation Committee meeting. Uh, it is May 14th and it is 8.30 a.m. Our, me our meeting is now in order. Um, our first item for the agenda is public comment. Pam, is there anyone here who has signed up for public comment or hands raised? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll give it a second. But no, I do not see any hands raised online or in person. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. So we will close the period for public comment and uh, begin with uh, the meeting summary, which is in attachment A. Were there any questions or changes? Seeing none, the meeting summary will be filed as distributed. And we have four action items this morning, so we'll get right to work. Uh, the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan Amendments, which is attachment B in your packet, and I believe that's being presented by Alvin Vidal Sanchez, Regional Transportation Planning Program Manager. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so as introduced, um, I'm presenting a culmination of about nine months of work to amend our 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, I'll run through some of the high-level uh, results from, from this amendment process. So we are talking about the amended 2050 Regional Transportation Plan as well as all the accompanying appendices. Um, there are about 19 to 20 that we also have as part of our plan document. I've pulled out two for your consideration as well as that'll be part of the motion. The Denver Southern Sub-Area 8-Hour Ozone Conformity Determination, so our federal air quality requirements, and then the Transportation Greenhouse Gas Report, uh, our state's uh, GHG planning standard requirements. Like I mentioned, this has been about a nine month long process. We kicked this off back in September of last year with a call for amendments. Um, since then, uh, the last three months of 2023, we're really modeling, coordinating with our project sponsors, making sure we were reflecting the projects appropriately in our model, in our plan. Um, the first couple months of this year, we're finalizing our documents, so making sure our main plan reflected these projects that we were moving forward with, and then updating all the different appendices that we also update when we make an amendment to our plan. Um, so part of that was updating Appendix S, which is our air quality conformity determination documents, and Appendix T, the GHG transportation report. We held a public and stakeholder review period March through April of this year. That included 30 days of public review, our official public hearing before the board, um, presenting to the Transportation Commission their review of the GHG report and the Air Pollution Control Division's review of the GHG report as well. And so we are now in the adoption and finalization stage of this work. Uh, TAC has recommended approval of the plan. Uh, we're now before y'all for a recommendation, hope to go before the board tomorrow, and then ultimately we'll be getting all of our materials together for a submittal to our federal partners and meeting the state's accessibility requirements by July 1 of this year. We have five amendments that we are processing in this cycle amendment process. They are across the region, um, four new projects, one existing project that is moving forward in our implementation timeline, so in our 2020 to 2029 staging period. For all of these, uh, there was an application submitted, staff review, we worked with project sponsors, regional partners to make sure all of these made sense to include. Um, there were seven applications submitted, we're only processing five. Um, one we determined wasn't eligible or didn't need to be shown in the plan, and one we uh, wanted to handle during our major four-year update that we'll be kicking off this year to have a more uh, holistic view of the corridor. A key piece of this uh, amendment update is the previous GHG emission reduction framework that we developed two years ago when we were first working on the RTP to be in compliance with the state's GHG planning standard. So all of that work that we uh, presented back, back two years ago um, has stayed the same, has been unchanged. So we kept this larger framework to be in compliance with the state's GHG rule. So showing those programmatic investments in our model, um, the mitigation measures have been unchanged since the original uh, plan was updated back in 2022. With that, um, we still do have to show GHG compliance even with an amended plan. This table shows uh, how we got to that, show that compliance with this plan, um, with the amendments that we're processing. So that first row is just the modeling, uh, the new modeling that we're doing with the projects that are shown in the plan. And then the programmatic 
row and the mitigation action plan row remain unchanged from two years ago when we first worked on the GHG planning standard. Um, so those calculations, um, those measures, those strategies have remained unchanged or carried forward into this update. So those values stayed the same. Um, for this effort, uh, you'll take the total greenhouse gas reduction row, compare that to the red row that is table one's emission reduction requirements in the rule, and we just need to make sure that we exceed those. So for each of those four analysis years that we are subject to, we do uh, achieve the emission reduction that's required. The other piece is our federal air quality requirements. So for the RTP does have to address ozone pollutants just as part of our air quality non-attainment status. Um, just as the GHG work is regional, our air quality work is regional. So it's not based on any individual projects, but it is part of the networks that get included in our model. And then as with the GHG work, the RTP does pass our pollutant emission tests for air quality. So a table for what that looks like um, compared to the GHG work, this is more of a ceiling that we can't exceed. So uh, the budgets on that first row, as you look at the four analysis years below that, we can't exceed any of those values in those analysis years. And so we do pass our air quality conformity requirements. Like I mentioned, there are a number of different pieces that are part of our plan. When we do an update, there are routine updates that we make to the plan documents, so making sure those projects are shown as appropriately in the plan. We do do some routine and minor updates to a couple other appendices in the plan, like our uh, performance measures uh, appendix, our financial plan appendix, and then the two big ones that we uh, put a lot of effort in are our air quality conformity documents and the GHG transportation report. And I will note the Transportation Commission has accepted the transportation report as part of their uh, requirements under the planning standard. Our public review ran from March 17th to April 17th. We developed uh, an online engagement site, um, a one-stop shop for folk to be able to come, a virtual workshop. Uh, just to be able to have all the different information available to them when they were ready to review. It included a discussion board for folk to be able to comment on and um, have other folk react to comment as well. Uh, also instructions on how to provide more formal comments, so whether emailing them to us or coming to our board public hearing. And so we did have that hybrid public hearing on April 17th. Uh, there were no uh, testifiers at that, that public hearing. Some examples of what we did to promote the uh, public review period and the online engagement site, an e-blast was sent out um, at the beginning of that 30-day public review period announcing it to the region, and then we did have a social media campaign providing a number of posts across our various social media platforms, just reminding folk, announcing to folk that we did have this plan. It was available for review uh, and when and how you could provide comments to us. Some highlights that we saw uh, through our engagement, um, we did have 13 social media posts. Um, our online engagement site had about 150 visits to it. Uh, we did have our one public hearing. Um, our e-blast had about a 42% open rate. That's pretty standard for us here at the agency when we provide e-blasts out announcing different materials available for the public. And so just a couple of different metrics that we uh, follow as we um, perform engagement and track engagement across our various plants and products. With that, we do have a proposed motion to move to recommend to the Board of Directors the draft 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and associated Denver Southern Sub-Area 8-Hour Ozone Conformity Determination and Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. Are there questions for Alvin? Wonderful job present presenting today. We have no questions. I look for a motion. Music, thank you. Saved. <laughs> I, I, I would second. <laughs> so you you move to recommend to the board of directors the draft 2050. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. As prepared by uh, staff, is there a second? Director Silverstein, thank you. Uh, uh, it's moved and seconded uh, as proposed by staff. Uh, is there further discussion? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Thank you. <laughs> Next is fiscal year 2024 through 27 transportation improvement plan. 
uh, or transportation improvement policy, program policy amendments, uh, which is attachment C in your packet. Josh Schwenk, senior planner, is here to present to us. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I do have three proposed amendments to our transportation improvement program for you this morning. Uh, the first is to add $8 million in federal bridge on system funds to the Region 1 BRO pool. Um, this funding is all going towards essential culvert repairs. The next is to add uh, a little over $18.2 million in prior year funding to the RTD bus and bus facilities project. Um, this is actually prior year funding, which was incorrectly not moved forward from our prior tip to the current tip, so we're just adding that funding back in. Uh, the third is um, nearly $127 million in a federal capital investment grant that was recently awarded to the East Colfax BRT project. Um, happy to take any questions on any of these. Otherwise, I do have a proposed motion available for you here in your packet. Thank you. Are there questions for Josh about this? Thank you. If if I could, Ron Papstorf with Dr. Guy. I just I don't want this to go through without people understanding the significance of the Federal Transit Administration Capital Improvement Grant Award to RTD and the City of Denver for the East Colfax BRT project. This is this has been a long time in the works. It is the first of what we plan to be several bus rapid transit corridors as part of a system in this region. And this is this is a significant um, issue and a significant and a, and a really big deal in an RTD in Denver to reach this point of having this award and being able to move forward with implementation of this project. Thank you. Helpful. Very helpful. Yes, Director Rosen. So a question about the uh, scope of the project. It says it's for purchase of fuel efficient buses um, and vans equipped with ADA compliant lifts. So how are these uh, buses and vans more fuel efficient and provide less emissions, greenhouse gas emissions than current, I guess the current buses that are new uh, for RTD? This is for the RTD capital improvements project? Yes. Um, so this is their uh, regular um, bus and facilities funding uh, project pool. So as they're purchasing newer buses, um, newer buses just in general are more efficient than older buses. So just by replacing those, um, that has uh, emissions impacts. And then they are looking at, um, you know, improved efficiencies of um, their buses as well. Um, did you have a... Uh, specific like fuel type question? It, it was, I mean, if there's a scope, if there's a like, you know, 10 to 20, 30% more fuel efficient than say buses from 10 years ago or whatever data you might have. I know I'm putting you on the spot here, um, but if you don't have that, we can follow up. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know that I can answer that perhaps. Director Welch might have some insight. Thank you. Uh, Chair Shaw and Director Rosenthal, this particular funding will go towards long needed improvements at our operating facilities at primarily East Metro and district shops. The, the narrative here under project scope is actually pretty straightforward language that comes from the statute for 5339 funding in general. So it's a more global description of how you can spend 5339, but in this case, we're gonna use it for those specific purposes. Thank you, and Director Adams, I believe you. Oh, you're you're okay. All right. Other questions? Uh, yes, Director Silver. Um, not a specific question on the um, on the amendments, but um, it would be uh, really uh, nice to receive in this in this committee a full briefing on BRT, maybe in the future, because there's this funding source, there's the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant that mentions, you know, BRT. There's the Non-Attainment Area Enterprise that's set as setting aside funding. There is the, the TIP itself that has um, approved funding for BRT in the future. So all of this working together, I would love to kind of see the big picture briefing on BRT. 
That makes sense. I think uh, that's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> And staff will take a note. <laughs> I do have, I do have a comment. Yes, uh, thank you. I, thank you for, uh, I, for making that comment. My own uh, yep, about the RT. Uh, I do talk to some merchants on that East Coast tax corridor from time to time, and there is a lot of confusion and concern regarding BRT. So I do think that we we deserve a, a really good briefing on exactly what the plans are. There are a lot of concerns around construction. The, the middle lane kind of uh, work that is that people believe we're going to do. Uh, a lot of merchants worried about the impact on their business while that work is is on, is ongoing. So I, I do appreciate the notion of a of a briefing on BRT. Thank you. Excellent. Other questions? Yes, Director Stewart. I'm forced to make a comment at this point. <laughs> Tonight is your opportunity to learn about BRT. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, uh, we have a federal BRT program going on at CDOT, and it's well underway, and we've had some public meetings, and another public meeting is tonight, 5 to 7 at the MAC Rec Center. Tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. Oh, gosh, I thought it was Wednesday. <laughs> I thought today was Wednesday. Yeah, tomorrow. Sorry, don't go tonight. Um, and it will be at um, the MAC Recreation Center in Westminster. And um, if you know, there's quite a collaboration going on between CDOT and RTD on the BRT um, opportunity for Federal Boulevard. Thank you. Is, is there a streaming uh, opportunity or is that in person only? No. In person meetings. Um, this will be the. We have one. Do we have one more after us? No, this is the third one that we've had. I'm going to turn it over to Jessica because. We had a meeting uh, last night at the CDOT headquarters building. We had about 75 people attend, which was fantastic. And we noticed that the stay time of individuals at the public meeting was about 30 to 45 minutes. So a lot of really great interest. We had a public meeting last Wednesday at the end of the corridor at Dartmouth. We had about 30 individuals attend that meeting, not quite as well attended, but general positivity. And then again, we have our third and final public meeting tomorrow night. All the boards will be posted online and the comment form is also posted online. So if you can't make one of the meetings, you're welcome to submit comments, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Other questions before we go to the motion slide? I think we can look for a motion then. Stuart. <laughs> I move that um, I recommend to the Board of Directors the attached project amendments to the fiscal year 2024-2027 Transportation Improvement Program. Thank you. A second by Director Wheel. Thank you. Any other discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Thank you. I think, Josh, you can stay right there because uh, our next item is fiscal year 24-25 Unified Planning Work Program Amendment. Thank you. Yes, thank you again, Chair. Um, so for those who may not be aware, our Unified Planning Work Program is the work program for uh, the Denver Regional Council of Governments uh, in our role as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Denver region. Um, so all of our work tasks are uh, included within this document. Um, it helps us to plan out uh, the work that we intend to do over a two-year uh, period. Um, the primary purpose of this amendment to the document is uh, that we recently closed out our previous consolidated planning grant contract uh, associated with our previous unified planning work program. So we are adjusting the financial tables in the back of the document uh, to roll over some remaining funding from that previous grant contract into the current one. Um, additionally, we uh, released the document out to staff for comment, any edits that needed to be made. Um, primarily, the changes that were made are fairly minor changes to the text uh, just to kind of clarify the scope of work in the document. We did have two new deliverables added. These would be a TDM incentives white paper as well as a regional safety vision zero quick build toolkit. 
Um, so those have been added as deliverables uh, within the time frame of this document. Um, happy to take any questions about the proposed amendment to the document. Otherwise, again, I do have a recommended motion available for you. Thank you. Are there questions on this for Josh or observations? Yes, Director Stewart. Sure. Not on there. there I read your red line. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I just had a question on the mobility hubs part under innovative mobility planning. It used to say quite a bit about mobility hubs, and now it just says prepare a mobility hub hubs in the Denver region white paper. Will we see more about that? And I remember a while back that uh, CDOT had done a white paper on mobility hubs, and I don't think that ever got published. Is there coordination with CDOT on this one? I believe there is. I, I believe the changes um, within that section are primarily just to kind of more generalize the language. Um, I think we're still looking into that, so there will be work to come. Um, I think it was just kind of to make it a little bit more general, um, increase kind of the range of scope that could that we could participate in looking forward. Um, but I, I don't believe we're actually removing any planned work from what we we're intending to do. I'd be, I'd be interested in an update on that later on when it starts to come to fruition. We have a number of important mobility hubs that are identified along I-25. Um, from north to south, and so uh, I know it's important, and it goes along with BRT, so there you go. Thanks. Um, thank you, Mr. Shaw. Just to, just to elaborate a little bit, Josh is absolutely correct. We really wanted to sort of give a little bit more flexibility to that evaluation. We're really, really appreciative, and we are engaged with CDOT on sort of CDOT's mobility hubs along the I-25 corridor. This effort is really more focused on opportunities outside of the freeway corridor, outside those CDOT mobility hubs along I-25 to seek out other opportunities around the Denver region where mobility hubs might be appropriate. So those could be tied to where future BRT corridors intersect with the existing light rail or commuter rail system, for instance, uh, designated urban centers around the region where uh, significant regional transit services come together, right? So this is really more of a Dr. Cog effort to explore those opportunities out, uh, in addition to CDOT, the mobility hubs the CDOT is pursuing to serve Bustang along the I-25 corridor. Thank you for that. Um, that's interesting because you know the the, the it, this is like BRT. Mobility hub means something to one person and something to somebody else, right? And so our C dot I twenty five mobility hubs have some real specificity on how it has to provide TDM and how it has to be connectivity and all that kind of stuff. And so as we talk about a mobility hub that's internal to the Denver metro region that serves something different, it'd be interesting to see how we do some clarification on the definition, I guess. Thanks. And that may be kind of why we make the language more general so that we can kind of insert the appropriate papers. It's a really good observation. Thank you. Other questions? Hearing none, I see the recommended motion on the slide if someone would like to make that. Uh, Director Guzman, thank you. Oh, there we go. Move to recommend to the Board of Directors the amendment for the fiscal year 2024-2025 Unified Planning Work Program for the Denver region. Director Pakbas. Second. Thank you. Motion in the second. Any discussion? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. I have it, and the motion is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. And our next item is Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 Fiscal Year 24 Funding Awards, which is Attachment E in your packet. We have presenting for us Travis Noon, Program Manager, Administration and Finance. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for, for having me back. 
Uh, I'll dive in a little bit to uh, some background here as a reminder, but fo we'll focus mostly on why I'm back and presenting these to you all again uh, this month, like we did last month. So uh, just a quick uh, reminder on the background here, Dr. Cog is the designated recipient for Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 funding for the Denver or urbanized area. Uh, this fund, these funds are used to support capital operating and mobility management projects in the region that meet the needs of older adults and individuals with disabilities. Uh, we release a yearly call for projects, and we released this call this year in November 2023. Uh, we received proposals from 10 organizations requesting $4.1 million. Uh, there is approximately $3.1 million available for July 1, 2024 through June 30th, 2025. Um, this is what has changed it and why we're back here is that this is a reduction from what my estimate was. Uh, all these applications are reviewed and scored uh, by a panel who make the recommendations to you all. Uh, so diving into a little bit about why we're, why I'm back here, um, I originally estimated the funding based on five-month apportionments from the Federal Transit Administration. Unfortunately, this is sort of how it works when the feds are delayed with budgets. Um, and I had originally estimated that there would be $3.3 million available based on those apportionments for federal fiscal year 24. Uh, unfortunately, once the full apportionments were released in April, uh, the actual available funding for fiscal year 24 is approximately $2.9 million. <clears throat> there, are also, there is also some carryover from prior years and a small portion of human services transportation set aside. Uh, faster funding from prior years that is being allocated through this uh, call, which makes up that $3.1 million. Uh, looking at ways to adjust these awards down uh, based on projected unspent funding available um, to carry over for the Dr. Cog project um, from federal fiscal year 23, uh, we are recommending that we reduce the Dr. Cog award down from the 900,000 that is recommended here to the 516,346. Um, really, based on what's unspent and what we'll be able to carry over, uh, it will be minimal impact, if any, on the Dr. Cog budget. Um, all other rewards are remaining the same as recommended by the review panel. These are the awards here. Like I said, they are the same as I present, presented to you all last month, aside from that one line there for the Dr. Cog project, the mobility management project being down to 516. I'm happy to answer any questions about the project or any of the anything that I presented. Um, otherwise, I do have the recommended motion here to you all for you all. Thanks. Thank you. Are there questions for Travis? And thank you for hunting for extra money and for the adjustment that Dr. Cog was able to make to their own funding. Um, I think that is much more of a comfortable outcome for the providers who may have already committed to staff based on preliminaries. So I appreciate that. Other, other comments? Otherwise, I look for a motion. Motion to recommend to the Board of Directors approval of the FTA Section 5310 awards for the period beginning July 1st, 24 and ending June 30th, 25, as recommended by the review panel and adjusted by Dr. Cog staff. Thank you, Director Clark. And is there a second? Director Holguin, thank you. Uh, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Ayes have it, and that motion is adopted. Thank you so much, Travis. Next up, we have a discussion item, non-determination, non-discrimination program update from Alvin Vidal Sanchez, Regional Transportation Planning Program Manager. Thank you so much, Alvin. Chair? So I'll be giving an update on a process we undertake every three years here at Dr. Cog. It's an update to our non-discrimination programs. Um, this comes out of our requirements as a designated recipient of 5310 funding, as Travis just noted. So we do update our suite of plans that make up our non-discrimination program every three years. Um, I will go over what each of those four plans are. There are three existing plans, one new proposed plan, a scope of the update that we're looking to make to each of those since our last update, and then a timeline that we're looking forward to over the next year. 
start with our most expansive plan. It's our Title VI implementation plan. It's the way we show that we have all the different procedures and resources in place to make sure that our program services activities are non-discriminatory, accessible, inclusive to the region. Um, it documents all of our related activities in the past three years. Um, so our major plans and programs, what plans did we adopt, amend, um, and how do we do that in a non-discriminatory way? And it's a way for the public and our subrecipients to be aware of our process for reviewing those programs and projects to make sure we're in compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. A key piece is a demographic profile of the Denver region. And so this new update will have um, the same demographic profile. What are the different marginalized communities within our region that we want to keep on the lookout for and how are they geographically distributed across our 10 county area? And then we pair that with our transportation investment analysis. So looking at um, what has historically been our most recent transportation improvement program funding, how does that lay out across the region and how does that compare to these different marginalized communities across the region um, to make sure that there isn't a disproportionate or disparate impact on particular communities. Like I mentioned, it's our most expansive plan. So in addition to those two key pieces, it also just outlines all of the policies and procedures we have in place. What are our accommodation statements? How do we provide accommodations to the public? Um, what do staff do to make sure that our program services activities are non-discriminatory? It goes through our board and committee structure. How are these um, non-discriminatory accessible as well to members of the public? Uh, it outlines all the different work that we do as an agency. What are the different key products of our various staff divisions? So. RTP, TIP, UPWP from our transportation side, what are our regional planning and development staff doing? What are our area agency on aging staff doing? What are those key products and how are they accessible, inclusive, non-discriminatory as well? A new piece that was uh, put in in our last update was subrecipient monitoring. So that relates to our 5310 DR status. So making sure our subrecipients as well are in compliance with Title VI. We outline all the data that we have available to us to make sure we're having informed decisions related to these conversations, and then outline our public participation strategies to make sure we're providing members of the public all different ways to engage with us and in ways that make sense for them. Our second plan is the limited English proficiency plan. Um, goal of this one is to make sure that all members of the region can participate as much as possible in our activities. So it outlines the different ways that we provide language assistance, how we identify those folk in the region who might need language assistance, um, what that assistance could be, and then training and resources that are available to staff here at Dr. Cog. Just as the Title VI plan had an assessment, um, the Limited English Proficiency Plan also has an assessment of the region. Where do folk um, who have limited English proficiency live in the region? What is that geographic distribution? What are the top languages in the region? Um, how does that break down by county? And so that is also provided in our Limited English Proficiency Plan. We uh, base that plan on a four-factor analysis, uh, guidance from our federal partners, just to help us determine what are the resources we can bring to bear in these conversations, recognizing we cannot translate every document, um, provide interpreters for every meeting, but how do we make those decisions to make sure they're as accessible, inclusive, equitable as possible? So we use these four questions to help us determine what our LEP program looks like here at the agency. Um, the first, the number of people who are limited English proficient in the region, um, how often they'll come in contact with our work, how important is that program service or activity in particular? And then what are our resources that we have available to help in those conversations? Our third existing plan is the Americans with Disabilities Act Program Access Plan. Uh, so it looks at the different requirements that we have under our requirements as an agency and just documents how we're making sure we're accessible in various forms, um, physical accessibility, um, website accessibility for folk with disabilities to engage with us through our products. I mentioned it includes a number of different pieces. One is office space. While we don't own um, this building, we do rent. We make sure our office space is compliant with the ADA. How are we providing our website? Um, what tools, resources are available on our website? What functions are available through browser extensions to make sure folk um, who need to change the way they interact with our website can do that? Uh, our public meetings are always held in accessible forums. Um, do we have them in accessible locations by transit? How do different people who move differently get there? Uh, and then we also outline our planning process, just running through how we're accessible, inclusive um, throughout our different milestones, deliverables that we achieve as an agency. And then just as with Title VI, we also make sure our subrecipients are compliant with the ADA as well. We do have a new plan that is also being proposed through this program. This is a disadvantaged business enterprise program plan. Um, it would only apply to our 5310 funding, so none of the other funding that we um, allocate as an agency, it would just be for our 5310 
portion of our funding, um, and that's as just, just as a result of us starting to hit a threshold, um, 250,000 that we anticipate being out for contracting uh, for through through our work, and so. Uh, we're required to have a DBE program. As we hit that threshold, hover around that threshold, we want to keep that plan in place just to make sure we're in compliance with our federal partners. Uh, and I would note that we do already have a DBE information request form that's included in all of our bid solicitations, our requests for proposals. Um, and so uh, anytime those do go out, we do receive that information from a potential folk looking to respond to those. So we do already have a portion of this program in place. This will just be formalizing what that looks like for us here at the agency in terms of reporting mechanisms, um, goal setting, and the like. So the scope of the update that we're looking at for our Title VI plan, we're wanting to move to a new marginalized communities definition. Um, we do, in our current plan, have a vulnerable populations data set. That's seven different indicators from the U.S. Census. Uh, we want to use the new 10 indicators that came out of our equity index work. And so we want to leverage those new indicators as well as our new equity index that we have here at the agency. Um, and we want to update our investment analysis to use, again, that index, but then also begin to talk about uh, the benefits, burdens, conversations that we began to have in the Transportation Improvement Program last year. For the Limited English Proficiency Plan, we're just looking at updating the data, um, just looking at what's new in the region and then reflecting some new procedures that we have in place at the agency. Uh, we do have a translation policy, so we provide training for that. We do do annual trainings for staff around limited English proficiency, so just reflecting practice here at the agency in this plan update. And then for the ADA Program Access Plan, we're wanting to uh, beef that up with all the different work that we've done in response to the state's accessibility legislation. So what are all the new procedures, processes, tools, guidelines, resources, trainings that we've unveiled in the last year, year and a half that respond to that to make sure we're providing accessible documents and products here at Dr. Cog. Our tentative schedule, uh, we've already been updating those different equity data sets, um, starting to perform those investment analyses. Uh, we hope to begin finalizing our documents this month, next month. Uh, we do want to begin our public review period over the summer. Uh, we will have a formal public hearing for this process, and then we'll get into the recommendation and adoption process, as we typically do with these plan adoptions, so TAC, RTC, and then the board with some briefings before then. With that, I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. Are there questions for Alvin? Yes, Director Guzman. The language efficiency plans that you have, is there a clear definition difference between interpretation and interpretation of those for, for meetings or documents? Because those are two different functions of, of work only mentioned. So, curious. Yes, there will be. Uh, yeah. So we, we also recognize that distinction, uh, translation of materials versus interpretation, um, like live and simultaneous interpretation in meetings. So that is a clarification we make. Thank you. Director Mulvey. On the same um, category, do you focus on um, particular language sets or are you trying to broaden it so that somebody who comes in can attain what they need? Um, so within within the data, we do highlight the, the top non-English languages in the region, languages other than English, um, that are used uh, in terms of uh, resources we make available. Uh, we do typically just default to Spanish in a lot of our work. That's the population that will most often that speaks language other than English deal with, at least on our transportation side. Um, from our area agency on aging side of the work, we do lean on them for some of the more lived experience of what are different languages that they're encountering in the region at a more granular level that we can't get through through the U.S. Census Bureau. So I would say it's a mix. Um, some of the, our more general resources are Spanish-focused, uh, but we do provide um, I speak cards in the document and to staff that outline, around, I think, around 31 different languages that are um, other than English that are spoken in, in the region, in the nation, and then we lean on our area agency on aging staff to help us out at a more granular level. Thank you. Director Holguin, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for this overview. I'm curious to learn about the, the DBE program, and um, I can't wait to read more of the details on that, but I'm, I'm wondering if at some point, maybe not today, but I would love to learn more about the Dr. Cog's emphasis or prioritization of DBE or small business outside of uh, 5310 funds. Thank you. And I see a note is being made. <laughs> Thank you. 
Other questions? Yes, Director Rosenthal. Thank you. And speaking of 5310 funds, approximately how much is received by uh, Dr. Cog every year um, that is subject to the DBE program? Uh, so for us, um, I believe it hovers around 200000 250000 um, So that threshold is what we're starting to hit, that $250,000 um, that will be subject to, to the DBE requirement. So um, that's what we're looking at focusing on. Thank you. And, and I guess I had had a question, and maybe it's worth a clarification. Uh, I think that DBE uh, now refers to something that we used to refer to as women and minority-owned businesses. Is that correct? Um, we do rely on uh, the, the state certification definition. Um, it does historically include small business enterprise, minority business enterprises, and women business enterprises. Um, but for this process, they do have to be certified through the state's uh, certification process. Um, so not all uh, women-owned firms um, potentially might not be a DBE if they're not certified through the state's process. Thank you. Great. Other questions, Director Holguin? Not necessarily a question, but DBE is race neutral, and so that's the distinction between the minority business and, uh, and DBE. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Other questions? All right. Good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, wow. <laughs> We've made a lot of progress. We're down to administrative items. Uh, member comment on other matters. CDOT is first. Mr. Hulking, do you have time to make a quick comment before you have to leave? And then we'll move it over to uh, Mr. Adams and Jessica and Darius. Sure, I can start. Uh, we have our, our workshops tomorrow and then our meeting on Thursday. We have a packed agenda and uh, a lot of decisions. And um, I, we're, I'm assuming that there will be a lot of public comment as well. Um, we have uh, quite a few items. Um, I will say that the, mo the thing that I'm most excited about, uh, we just got notification that we got the, the um, 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 busing buses that will be coming tomorrow and so we'll get to see it and so really interested in seeing the the efficient fuel efficiency and um it really the impact in um in our um, environment so um and then yeah i guess i'll leave the the rest of the comments for you all thank you i have no uh no additional comments i'll defer to jessica and to darius and to karen Thank you. Am I on? Okay. Um, yeah, so Region 1 has a couple exciting things to celebrate. Um, the I-25 GAP project received the ACEC National Environmental Excellence Award. So there's a ceremony right now going on. I think it's in Washington to receive that. I believe I-70 Central um, also received an award for that. Um, project. So exciting there. And we were just notified we received the FHWA Environmental Excellence Award. It was the only project in Colorado, and that's for our air quality monitoring um, along I-270 and the I-70 Mountain Corridor. So that air quality monitoring as part of the requirements under Senate Bill 260. Um, so we have a, we submitted our project, and the, the gal who's been conducting the research and monitoring the air quality results will be going to Maryland to accept that award. So really excited about those. Um, <clears throat> we mentioned the federal BRT public meetings, but we have a lot of public meetings going on right now in Region 1. I think a lot of our projects kind of had a stall maybe during COVID, and we are well underway, very busy. So again, the federal BRT public meeting is tomorrow night. The 23rd and Spear I-25 bridge replacements had a public meeting a couple weeks ago. We'll have another public meeting for that in August. The I-270 corridor improvements has had several public meetings, including um, personalized stakeholder engagement. So we're making really great momentum on that project. And then the segment two I-25 project is getting going in NEPA as well. And we anticipate having the first public meeting in August, July or August timeframe. Um, the limits on that project are US 36 to 104th. So we had a kind of a quiet period and we're, we're getting used to the dual 
um, virtual and in person, but we've had great turnouts for our in-person engagement. So we're excited to have the communities back and be able to engage with them one-on-one. -on -one. If you would like to be on a mailing list for any of those projects or you'd like more information, let me know and I can connect you with the team managers. And I'll, I'll finish off by saying that at, uh, at the commission this month, um, we're kicking off the process for the next long-range transportation plan and the associated documents. So we're doing a couple of the workshops on the overall um, 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 goals and looking at long-range revenue, and that will help kick off what is probably going to be many conversations with not only the commission, but with uh, local planning partners throughout the state, including Dr. Cog, including any of our uh, TPR partners uh, in the state as well. And I think there's going to be finality on the planning rule as well. There will be a decision on that. And the only other decision that's of, uh, that I want to mention is um, if the commission agrees, there will be a decision on the allocation of MMOF fund formula so that way um, all of the MPOs and the TPRs can make those make those decisions on the, um, uh, they'll know what money they're getting uh, for uh, FY25 and make decisions on those projects as well. That's it for me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Done. Wow. Thank you. All right. Next is RTD. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I'll kick it off. Um, I, I could just conclude my report by saying <laughs> the 2024 legislative session has ended. <laughs> but but I'll say some Thank more. God. Um, <laughs> as I, I spoke the last couple of times, I think, that we were here about that House Bill 1447, the Transit Reform Bill, went through a number of iterations, and it ultimately just went away. <clears throat> and I, I credit a team effort uh, you know, uh, our staff, our directors that are here in this room, um, other stakeholders, lobbyists, were, were very instrumental in making sure that uh, that uh, went the way it should have gone. But it was replaced by Senate Bill 230 that, <laughs> in theory, gives some money to transit and maybe some to RTD. We don't know how much or when or, 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 or if, but it also requires us to build, uh, come up with a plan to build two major transit lines within 10 years, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, and last but not least for me, uh, our Northwest Rail Peak Service Feasibility Study is due to conclude sometime soon. There seems to be um, issues getting BNSF, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe, to, to um, what it will cost to let us use it right away. And now that we have a competing interest of front range passenger rail, who wants to use the same right of way, they're kind of sitting in the catbird seat as to what they're going to charge. So uh, we're just moving forward on all fronts. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so one of the other bills was Senate Bill 32. So that's additional funding uh, for transit. Um, so my understanding is there would be about $5 million for the uh, zero fare for youth program uh, going to RTD and that we would not be allowed to uh, apply for funding for the zero fare for better air, uh, which has been, um, you know, such a success uh, in the past few years. Um, so we're looking to our leadership and discussions with the board as to, and with Dr. Cog as well, and any, any other entities about how to continue uh, that program and so that we do have funding either internally, externally, or both. Thanks. Could I ask a clarifying question? So, so that, so you've been precluded from asking for funding for that program. Can you explain more why? Um, perhaps, Brian, you might, uh, Mr. Welch, you might have some additional information, but that's my understanding. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Sean, Director Rosenthal. What the legislature did this time around is in the previous two years, they provided sufficient funding to offset RTD's fare loss related to not charging fares. The first year it was one month, and then last year it was two months. The legislature this time decided not to provide funding for that program for zero fare for better air, 
which means that if we wanted, if RTD board decided to pursue that program, we would need to fund it without the state's support. Okay, so I misheard then that that I thought it was that you couldn't apply for funding. So I'm glad at yeah, least that the clarification is there is no funding available. There, correct from the state. Okay. Right. Well, I wish you luck finding an alternative source. It is a good program. Well, and Madam Chair, quite possibly okay. the, oh, sorry. And one more follow-up. So for this summer, it's, it's, the program is not funded. Or are we okay for this summer, but it's future summers where we don't have the funding? There is no funding for this summer. Okay, because Regional Air Quality Council, part of our marketing summer program <laughs> is to refer to this program. So that's really important news for us. Yeah, the, the legislative approach to both Zero Fare for Better Air and the new program related to Zero Fare for Youth requires an annual decision by the legislature pro to provide funding. So there is no permanent ongoing way to fund those programs, which means that perhaps next year the legislature could fund uh, Zero Fare for Better Air. They will also need to take action next year to continue zero uh, zero fare for youth because that was that was provided just for one year at a time. One year, yes. And Director Rosenthal. Uh, so, but perhaps there might be somewhat of an alternative in in the Senate Bill 230 that was mentioned earlier that they do provide some funds for operations. Um, but again, RTD would have to apply for that just as much as any other transit agency statewide would have to apply for that funds. And that doesn't mean that we would get any at all or how much we would get to cover um, that. Is that correct, Mr. Welch? That is correct. Thank you, Director Apologies for interrupting the RTD um, update, but I, I think it will be helpful at some point to get some clarification on the results of Senate Bill 230, because I think our read of Senate Bill 230 is that the new um, oil and gas producer fee, the portion for transit, 70% of the funding is intended to be distributed to transit providers by formula that for operations to support operations and that formula would be developed by the clean transit enterprise that's housed at. Um, the, the remainder, the other 30, 10% would be available for competitive grants, primarily for sort of capital transit improvements and then 20% for uh, rail uh, transit improvements, I think mainly probably intended for Front range passenger rail support. So I, I, I believe that the 70% is supposed to be distributed to transit providers by formula so that RTD wouldn't necessarily have to compete and hope to get a grant. It would be distributed by formula. But we will continue to pursue some clarification on that and work with the clean transit enterprise to figure out the details as that moves forward. Just real quick to add to that, uh, is that that money would possibly start next year and maybe even the following, depending on when they start collecting it. So my understanding I, is like next July, September-ish time frame, 2025. So it would not even be for this year. Thanks. Good. And Director Mulvey? I might be able to offer a clarification on the formula funding and the applicability as a member of the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board, we reviewed 230 in its final days and final iteration. And as fast as it went through and as amended as it got, um, the three pots of 702010 still can, they're all competitive and they're not restricted to any form of transportation except roadways. Um, so any form of transit and apply for them, each one. Thank you. And now, and now back to the RTD report, <laughs> <laughs> Director Guzman. <laughs> I only have one quick thing to say tonight. We have the Finance and Planning Meeting Committee at RTD, um, and we will be going over quite a few things. It's a very heavy meeting, um, and it's leading up to the fun stuff of the budget, which obviously is a conversation that we have to have. Um, I will say this about all of the nonsense that happened at the legislature this year. It doesn't matter who's sitting in the director's seats. What matters is the work that we're doing and who we're partnering with and how we're getting it done. 
there is a fiscal reality that has not yet been addressed by the legislature and cannot possibly be imagined by the legislature that your directors do know and understand very intimately. Um, and it looks like, oh, we'll fund this, but we're going to make a decision every year so we won't know who to tell whether they can include RTD as a free resource during the month of July or August. Um, and then we have to make tough decisions like all of you do about what our budget looks like and where money goes and funds for planning for the future. Sad reality of being an elected official is that a lot of the work we do, especially on this group, we've, I've learned it last year, we may make plans for the next four years. We're not likely to see them come to fruition while we're sitting here doing this. It's rare that those opportunities happen. And so RTD is in the same position. We have a lot of catch-up work to do from previous board's decisions. We have a lot of planning to do to make RTD continue and work forward. And I think that there's an honest to goodness come to what is the what is the sine numine without name um, <clears throat> conversation that needs to be had because a lot of the strings that were attached to this legislation really dealt with I think a misplaced anger and frustration at humans who are trying to serve humans with limited funding, limited resources. And instead of having a really good conversation about what it is to lead an agency the size that we have with such limited funding, and we are very limited, okay? A third of, WMATA is a great example comparison, a third of our size with three times our budget. Okay? And the same multimodal situation that we have but they have state funding that puts them at $5 billion. We're nowhere near that. And our taxpayers pay for this service with the state chipping in maybe 1% a year for our operating costs. We, we got to get real and have an honest conversation about it. And I think some of the um, disrespect and the tone of the legislative season this year has really done damage to being a public servant and publicly elected leaders for all of us. It's not just RTD board. I think we got all collectively drug through the mud this year. Um, but, you know, my grandmother taught me if you never get in the mud, you never learn to respect the earth. And since everything that we do <laughs> is to respect the earth and the land that we're on, uh, I think that we can have that conversation in a very different way. Um, there's another bit, but I saw Brian has the notes. I'm going to let him speak to that because I haven't fully <laughs> read through that document yet, and I want to be very careful about what I say. Thanks. Uh, so the only thing I'll add before we uh, move to Michael is, uh, Chair, the uh, August, let's see, August 29th, 2011, I joined the RTD staff. Okay, so what? Well, August 30th, 2011, in Arvada, there was a, a signature put on a full funding grant agreement for a $1 billion capital investment grants program for the, what we now called the Eagle Project, which included the airport line. Well, Brian, why, what's that relevant? Well, April 2016, big fanfare over at the airport. We opened uh, a connection between Denver International Airport and Denver Union Station. Everybody knows that any major metropolitan area has to have a transit connection from their biggest you know, central business district to their airport, or they're just not there yet. Ha ha, LA. Anyway, so, <laughs> anyway. So here we fast forward to May uh, 2024. I'll say this correctly. RTD was successful in defending against Denver Transit Partners' appeal in the Colorado Court of Appeals regarding its claim of approximately $111 million in damages against RTD. So we finally settled that, we think. Uh, there's still one more step. Uh, potentially, Denver Transit Partners could appeal to the Colorado Supreme Court uh, on that decision, but for the time being, eight years later, that has been adjudicated. Thank you. Director Silverstein. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, uh, not, a, not as many things going on at RAC compared to uh, <laughs> what's happening here, but uh, the legislative session, we, we got a, a, a victory at, at, at the legislature. Very small victory, but, but nevertheless, um, our anti-idling bill was, uh, was approved by the legislature, signed by the governor uh, a few weeks ago. And so that now allows local governments to enact uh, more stringent anti-idling programs than the state um, provision allows. So that's good. And so RAC is going to be doing outreach to local governments to provide resources and, and opportunities to, um, you know, suggest, um, say, model ordinances 
and other things that can have a significant air quality improvement, but also give local governments their um, ability to um, regulate idling vehicles uh, more so than they can a few weeks ago. Um, our summertime ozone season will begin here in the first of June is usually our kickoff. We have had a few um, high ozone days. They were uh, naturally occurring ozone, what are called stratospheric ozone intrusions. That means our upper level ozone that protects us from harmful uh, rays from the sun um, gets kind of forced down to ground level here at high altitudes. And uh, we get, it's ozone is ozone. It's the same thing. It's just we didn't make it. And so um, that, um, that shouldn't count against us in our, in our quest to uh, uh, reach attainment of federal air quality standards. And uh, again, so our summer campaign will begin here um, in a few short weeks, and uh, we hope that we can partner with all of you to uh, get our messages out and, and get your messages out, too, that can um, make positive improvements for air quality. And then finally, um, not anything from um, the racks doing, but a reformulated gasoline. You've probably seen a lot of media around the new gasoline that will be um, in our pumps and should actually be in our pumps today. Um, the, uh, because we have been a chronic um, violator of federal air quality standards, our region has been downgraded to what's called severe classification by the EPA. That was a couple of years ago. And when you become a severe non-attainment area, guess what? You have to have the cleanest emitting gasoline blends in the pump during the summer months. And so this will be our first uh, season with reformulated gasoline. Um, they, the cost estimates are wildly um, all over the place. Um, historically, you might see a 10 to 30 cents a gallon increase. Uh, most um, summertime uh, blends require additional refining, and um, this is this is true across the nation. We've just received a report that it might be 60 cents a gallon. I, I think that's um, that's the kind of uh, sky is falling scenario, but you never know. And prices haven't gone up yet, so. We, we have RFG in the tanks in, at the fuel farms, and, and so far, so good. So it's just the way it goes, I think, because we, the, the, go, the administration issued a study or that um, said it's 60 cents a gallon. I have a hunch it's going to be 60 cents a gallon because now there's permission to, uh, you know, charge what, um, you know, might be, uh, you know, already in the news. And, hey, guess what? It came true. We'll see. I, I hope that's that's not negative thinking on my part. That's not a conspiracy theory, I hope. Here. But uh, you know how it goes with gasoline prices. You never know what they're going to be and, uh, and why. But um, it is a, a cleaner burning blend. It's going to give us positive uh, air quality improvement. It's not the magic bullet, but it is one more step that um, is required of us to uh, achieve better air quality. So that's just a, just a editorial remark here for the group. And any questions, I'd be happy to take. Thank you. If you will indulge the chair for just a moment, this is my last meeting with all of you. Uh, I uh, was not elected mayor, and I'm term limited on city council. So I just wanted to say thank you to the Dr. Cog staff for the wonderful presentations that uh, often don't even generate questions because they're so darn clear. Uh, and uh, for the good discussions that we've had during the member updates, I think I get uh, almost as much information in these member updates as I get from uh, the third presentation. So it's been my honor to serve you as chair. Um, if you would like to join me after the meeting for a quick photo, I bet Cam would take a photo for us. Uh, that would be great. Um, and uh, please note that there is no RTC meeting in June. Our next meeting is July 16th, and it is uh, 934, and we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>